Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Royal Photographic Society's Historical Group and this latest in the series of collection and archive talks around photography. Uh, it's a pleasure this evening to hand over the, to the group's chair, Gilly Reid, who will introduce our speaker. Over to you, Gilly. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Hello, everybody. I have great pleasure in introducing Sally Kent of the Royal Commonwealth Society Photographic Collection. She is a qualified archivist and curator of the Royal Commonwealth Society collections at Cambridge University Library. Prior to this, she was a project archivist in the Department of Archives and Modern Manuscripts at the University Library. Her primary research interests are in settler colonisation in South Southern Africa and the history and development of national archival institutions in former British colonies in Africa. I hope that was okay, Sally. Yes, so thank I, you. Over to you now. Great, thank you. I have to admit that I um, didn't know about the Royal Commonwealth Society until we started this. So this is all new and interesting. That's great. Thank you. And uh, good evening, everyone. A special thank you to Michael and Gilly for the invitation to speak. Um, as Gilly's just mentioned, I'm an archivist working at Cambridge University Library, so I'm not actively researching a photograph collection or a particular photographer. But as part of my day to day work, I manage a collection of some 125,000 images of various formats which form the photograph collection of the Royal Commonwealth Society, the RCS for short. And while much of the collection has already been catalogued, listed and described, and rehoused in archival standard packaging, there's still a lot of work to do around the digitization of the collection, making the digital images available via our online digital library platform, supplying and licensing the use of images, answering inquiries and processing a steady trickle of donations. So the focus of this talk will really be to provide an introduction to the collection, to explain very briefly what the Royal Commonwealth Society was and is, why the collection is in Cambridge, and to give a virtual tour of some of the significant component collections that make up this photograph collection. I'll also spend a little bit of time explaining how you can access our holdings, both via the online catalogue and Cambridge Digital Library. Uh, the image on this first slide is of the park in Peter Maritzburg in Natal, so now KwaZulu-Natal province in South Africa. It was taken in 1899 by a colonial civil servant called Edward Melville. He was a government surveyor and evidently a keen amateur photographer. It's a platinum print, and although you probably can't see it on this picture, um, Melville's stamp is imprinted in relief on this bottom right-hand corner. Melville was a member of the RCS, and he presented the, his collection of prints to the Society in 1899. This was typical of the means by which the Society's photograph collection grew and developed. The full collection of 17 prints was recently digitised as part of a project to open up Southern African material in the collections. And as a result, we now have these wonderful high resolution images to use. Um, so onto the RCS itself. The society was founded in 1868 as the Colonial Society, a meeting place for gentlemen connected with or interested in the colonies. Women, incidentally, were admitted under associate status in 1909. And the society really followed the model of other learned societies of the Victorian age, with emphasis on the creation of a library, a reading room, and a meeting place to facilitate the reading of papers and wider discussion on subjects to do with empire. A royal charter was granted in 1869. Changes in the name of the society from the Royal Colonial Institute to the Royal Empire Society and finally to the Royal Commonwealth Society in 1958 reflect wider developments through the 20th century from the very peak extent of empire to the emergence of newly independent states 
and the establishment of the Commonwealth of Nations. Today, the RCS is a charitable, non-governmental organisation which promotes, in its own words, Commonwealth values, particularly championing youth empowerment, literacy and environmental projects. Divorced from its original purpose and facing the prospect of being broken up and sold, the RCS Library Collection was transferred to Cambridge University Library in 1993, following a public fundraising campaign. So the collection retains the name of the RCS Library, but its essential character has changed. Most notably, having been a working reference library with holdings accessible on open shelving, as you can see from the images on the screen, one of which was taken in 1936, and the other shortly after the Second World War. The collection today is housed in the closed access stacks of Cambridge University Library. The images on this slide are from the Society's own collection of some 2,000 prints, transparencies and slides depicting individuals, buildings and major events in the Society's history. The library collection was built up through purchase and subscription and a steady stream of ad hoc donations from colonial governments, colonial institutions, and individual members of the society, such as Edward Melville. From a very early stage, the value of collecting photographs was recognized. By 1896, the society was actively encouraging photographic contributions from its members overseas. Topically, the library collection ranges from popular to specialist academic. In a similar vein, the photograph collection consists of works of well-known commercial photographers, many of whom may well be recognisable to <clears throat> members of the audience, as well as amateur and unknown photographers. And collectively, there's a really dizzying array of formats, from albums, lantern slides, 35 millimetre slides, glass plate negatives, to loose prints and panoramas and a real variety of historic photographic processes are represented across the collection. Historically, library material was arranged on the shelves, initially by geographical region, rather than by topic or subject area. And access was, and still is largely through, a labyrinthian card catalogue, here pictured in the rare books reading room at Cambridge University Library. In a 2008 article published in the Journal of Historical Geography, Ruth Craggs described the library's card catalogue as a means of recreating the world in a box. The archive collection, where the 827 component sub-collections of photographs are situated, both physically and intellectually, is well catalogued online, and there is fortunately no recourse to use the card catalogue. About 85% of the archive is described and is discoverable online via our archive catalogue, which is called Archive Search. And I'll say a bit more about that later on. Here you can also see an example of the old TypeScript photograph catalogue, which was used before the electronic catalogue was created. To return very briefly to the historic management of the collection, a geographical classification scheme adapted from the library collection applies to the photograph collection. So class marks, which is the unique reference given to each collection and ideally to each individual image in a collection, comprise the prefix Y30, followed by a country classification. The classification begins with 11 for Commonwealth, general and miscellaneous, and ends with 9993 for Samoa. So to give you an example of that, Y3022 is the classification for photographs of India, which includes areas of pre-partition Pakistan and Bangladesh, which was formerly East Pakistan. An additional letter is added to the end of the class mark to make this a unique identifier for each collection. So there are currently about 80 sub-collections relating to India starting at the class mark Y3022A, and now extending all the way to Y3022ZZZZ, uh, something of a mouthful. 
uh, each image is then individually numbered. So in the example, which is currently on the screen, uh, from the collection Y3022B, image number 135, is a photograph of Mthura, the birthplace of Lord Krishna, in Uttar Pradesh in India, attributed to Samuel Bourne, a Kolkata-based professional photographer. And again, I'll be saying a little bit more about him later on. Um, another example taken from the collection Y0322X is a photograph of a street scene in Peshawar taken in the 1920s, at a time when the city was in the northwest frontier province of British India. Today, the city is in Pakistan. The photographer is unknown, and this image is taken from a competition album which was presented to what was then the Royal Empire Society by the High Commissioner for India. In another example, the prefix Y307 relates to photographs of the Caribbean, with yet more subdivisions for each island or territory. So on screen here, we have a photograph showing the view from the harbour looking along King Street in Kingston, Jamaica. This image is attributed to the firm of Adolphe Dupley and Sons. Also pictured is a bird's eye view of Georgetown, the main settlement in Demerara, now Guyana's capital city, attributed to Julio Augusto Caesar. The album from which this Guyanan photograph is taken is another compilation album of mainly commercial photographs, although most of them are unattributed. So, of course, some photograph collections don't neatly relate to a single territory or to an identifiable country. You can't really divide up the collection um, in the way that the photograph classification scheme was envisaged. Some collections depict a journey which covers across multiple territories or the work of an individual or an organisation. And trying to contort these collections into a strict classification scheme doesn't work. So alongside the classification scheme, there's also a series of what are known as named collections. And we've already encountered one of them, which was the society's own photograph collection in an earlier slide. And I've listed some of the main named collections here. They include the British Association of Malaysia and Singapore, a collection which documents key historical events in Southeast Asia, and the lives of the ordinary British men and women who settled there. The Central Office of Information, which was established after the Second World War, almost as a successor to the wartime Ministry of Information, existed to record and disseminate information relating to conditions in the colonies. Of particular importance in this collection are the photographs of various constitutional and independence conferences going all the way from Antigua through to Zanzibar. The Church Missionary Society collection documents the work of a 20th century evangelical missionary organisation. It was a working collection used to illustrate the Society's various internal and external publications. Alfred Hugh Fisher was an artist and photographer commissioned by the Colonial Office Visual Instruction Committee in 1907 to provide visual material about the empire for use in textbooks and teaching in British schools. And again, I'll return to Fisher's photograph collection later. I'm just gonna give you a few examples of some of the named collections. Uh, this slide shows three images from a very large collection of slides compiled by a British civil servant and diplomat called John Hewitt Marnham. There are over 1,635 millimetre slides which document his career as an assistant under Secretary of State in the Colonial Office, later the Foreign Office, covering his travels and postings in the Caribbean, the Falkland Islands, the South Pacific, Malta, Cyprus, Jordan, South Arabia, which is now known as Yemen, and Southern Africa. These three images are from a tour to what was then Basutu land, now Lesotho, on the eve of independence in 1965. 
Marnham's collection was donated to the RCS by his widow in the late 1980s. The Queen Mary collection is another of the major named collections, and it comprises 29 albums documenting royal tours to British India in 1875-6, 1901, 1905-6, and 1911-12 on the occasion of the Delhi Durban the proclamation of George V and Queen Mary as the Emperor and Empress of India. Uh, this image is taken from an earlier tour from the visit of George and Mary, who are then styled as the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and York, to Ceylon, so Sri Lanka, in 1901. Some of the albums in the collection document the royal tour and its itinerary, while other albums were presentation volumes given to the royal couple as souvenirs of their visit. Queen Mary donated most of the material she accumulated to the India Office Library. Following independence and partition in 1947, she withdrew her collection and subsequently gave it to the Royal Empire Society. So um, before moving on to spend a bit more time showing you some more detailed highlights of the collection, I thought it might be useful at this point to briefly explain how the collection can be accessed and used. With the advent of the online catalogue and its search capacities, you'll be relieved to know that you don't know, you don't need to know very much at all about class marks and country classification schemes. The RCS photographs are described online via our archive catalogue, as I mentioned, archive search. And you can easily find the site by searching on any browser for Cambridge Archive Search. Uh, this is what the homepage looks like. It's a Cambridge-wide union catalogue covering a number of repositories across the university, the colleges of the university and the city, and there's several million catalogue entries. So to show you a worked example of how the catalogue works, um, you can carry out a simple search by keyword. So in this example, I chose Ghana as the keyword. And you can see that a large number of results will be returned from various different archive repositories. You can use the filters on the menu on the right hand side to restrict your results to the RCS collection. To do this, you need to click on the heading, which says Royal Commonwealth SOC, followed by the code. Um, as indicated, hopefully, by the arrow on the slide. You can also filter search results by date, name, subject, and so on. You can similarly interrogate the catalogue with the name of an individual photographer or a photography firm. Now, um, once you've identified a collection or a photographer of interest, the catalogue will give you information about the collection as a whole. So things like the title, the provenance, the extent of the collection, a summary of the contents. You can also find information on the individual images making up a collection. So as I mentioned, the photograph collection has been extensively worked on. And generally speaking, it's described the level of individual items or individ individual photographs. One of the things I've been working on in the last year or so is to add links where materials been digitized. So the example on screen is taken from the Institute of Education collection relating to the Gold Coast, present day Ghana, taken about 1954. If you click on the thumbnail, which is displayed, you'll be taken to the digitized collection, which is hosted on Cambridge Digital Library, which we commonly abbreviate to Cuddle. So adding links from archive search through to Cuddle is a work in progress, but I hope to have added thumbnails for all the digitized material in the next year or so. Once you're on the digital library, you can view or download very good quality images by clicking on the button, which is towards the bottom of the screen. You can also see that the metadata relating to each image is displayed alongside the images. You can browse albums or collections, and they've been specifically presented on the digital library to replicate their physical forms as far as possible. So typically, this means that album covers, spines, blank pages, 
and sometimes even the reverse of loose prints have been imaged. About one fifth to one quarter of the RCS photograph collection has been digitized and we add material on a fairly regular basis as funding and copyright procedures allow. So on the digital library, there are four themed collections relating to the Royal Commonwealth Society. Um, not all of the material is photographic. There's also archival collections, artwork, and a small number of objects. So the digital library can be used as an alternative to archive search, with the caveat, of course, as I've just mentioned, that only about a fifth or a quarter of the collection has been digitized to date. Um, and I've put links to these slides, um, sorry, I've put links to these sites on my final slide um, if you want to follow up with anything there. So for the remainder of this evening's talk, um, I want to take you on something of a virtual tour of the collection, looking at some of the highlights and the collection strengths. As will have been apparent from the general introduction, thematically, the collection covers the period of almost relentless British imperial expansion from the midpoint of the 19th century up until the period of decolonization from the 1950s and 1960s onwards. In many ways, the collection can also be used to chart the history of photography as a practice from its earliest days. And over the next couple of slides, I'll illustrate this thematic sweep with examples of images from the opening up of territories under British influence to examples of the emergence of independent nation states. So on the screen now is an image showing part of the process of the proclamation of a British protectorate in southeast New Guinea in 1884. This is today's Papua New Guinea. This is one of a series of photographs in an album depicting a flag raising ceremony and the celebrations which followed. The photographer hasn't been positively identified, but a number of images from this album appear in some of the earliest illustrated published accounts of New Guinea. The album was presented to the Royal Colonial Inst Institute by the government of New South Wales. As a side note, the Royal Colonial Institute took a particular interest in the annexation of New Guinea in the 1880s, and it represents an early example of the society attempting to assert itself as a pressure group on colonial affairs. Another example of an album which shows the opening up of a territory to British influence is a series of photographs taken by William Ellerton Fry, which document the British South Africa Company's occupation of Mashonaland, later part of Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe in 1890. Fry was appointed the official photographer for the Pioneer Column, which trekked from an area close to what is now the Botswana border to the site of present-day Harare. As with the album which depicts the proclamation of New Guinea, Fry's photographs were later reproduced in an illustrated history. About 20 copies of this album are known to be in existence. The RCS's copy was presented in 1947 by the archivist of what was then Southern Rhodesia. So alongside these very obvious visual depictions of British imperial expansion, there are countless examples of the raising of the Union Jack and group photographs of explorers and pioneers. The RCS photograph collection also documents interactions with local leaders or existing systems and instruments of government. Thus, while the collection undoubtedly provides a visual perspective of British colonialism through British eyes, there are also glimpses of the colonized peoples too. So on the left of this screen is a digitized image of a lantern slide from Ernest Gedge's expedition to Uganda in 1889 on behalf of the Imperial British East Africa Company. Pictured um, seated at the front of the image is Mwanga II of Buganda one of a group of Ugandan leaders who were coerced around this time into negotiations with British 
representatives. It's also likely that the figure on the far right of the image, uh, partially out of shot, is Apollo Kagua, later prime minister of the kingdom of Buganda. These early images of political leaders are of huge importance to communities in Uganda, where much documentary heritage was destroyed under the regime of Idi Amin in the 1970s. On the right of the screen is an image from a photograph album compiled by Sir Philip Crampton Smiley, Chief Justice of what was then the Gold Coast. The image shows an assembly of Ashanti chiefs taken at Kumasi in July 1924. At the time, Nana Prempe I, ruler of the Ashanti Kingdom, had been exiled by the British to the Seychelles. What's particularly useful in the case of this photograph is that most of the individuals have been identified and this information has been preserved and recorded in the catalogue. Unlike most of the rest of the album, this was an official photograph taken by an individual called RSG Agri, as you may be able to spot by the stamp just along the right-hand side of the photograph. Agri was from Sierra Leone and is among one of the earliest African photographers active in West Africa. So these few examples hopefully illustrate both the significance of the content of the collection, so the individuals and the events captured, as well as the significance the photographers represented. <clears throat> Staying uh, geographically with Ghana for the time being, the Gold Coast colony, including the Ashanti Kingdom, achieved independence from Britain in 1957, one of the first colonies in Africa to gain its independence. As well as documenting the opening up of territories, the RCS photograph collection also captures the end of British rule and the emergence of independent nation states. The examples I've selected on this slide are taken from personal collections rather than official photographs. So here we have an image of Kwame Nkrumah, the first prime minister and later the first president of independent Ghana. The photograph is from an album compiled by a colonial administrator called Peter Cannon, who was in the Gold Coast in the immediate lead up to and aftermath of independence. And the image on the right is a 35 millimeter slide, part of a collection of several thousand slides taken by Wilfred Court, a British architect. Court was also in Accra during the 1957 independence celebrations. This image was taken in 1961 and shows the newly constructed Black Star Square or Independence Square in Accra which was completed for the state visit of Elizabeth II to Ghana and is now the site of Ghana's annual Independence Day Parade. Um, typically, material documenting the end of British rule is to be found in some of the named collections which I ran through earlier, particularly the Central Office of Information photograph collection which contains a series of photographs of many of the conferences which led to constitutional progress and the independence of individual nations. The large modern Commonwealth collection similarly documents the emergence of the Commonwealth of Nations and includes portraits of various heads of state and government. The photographs which are currently on screen show the 1964 general elections in Nigeria, the photographs were taken four years after Nigeria achieved independence and just before it entered into a period of military coups, violence and civil war. The purpose of these photographs was to showcase a new mass printing technique which was used during the elections. Many of the photographs in the modern Commonwealth collection were supplied by agencies and they were actively accumulated by the RCS for use in various iterations of its journal. So you can easily see that the RCS collection straddles both the colonial and the post-colonial period. And this perspective covered is both that the official view and the personal view. 
I'd now like to spend a bit of time focusing on a few of the notable photographers or photography firms which are represented in the collection. So I've already mentioned Samuel Bourne, who was a prolific 19th century commercial photographer. Together with Charles Shepard, he set up the firm of Bourne and Shepard in Calcutta. This is one of his famous images of the Taj Mahal in Agra, taken from a compilation collection of prints of Samuel Bourne and Bourne and Shepard. The quote which accompanies the photograph is from an article which was written by Bourne in the British Journal of Photography. Bourne had been a keen amateur photographer working at a bank in Nottingham before he set up in India in 1863. He made three substantial travel photography journals, uh, journeys through the Indian subcontinent in the 1860s, amassing a collection of over 1,500 similar views of Indian architecture, landscape and peoples, very much with a commercial audience in mind. At the same time as he was making these journeys, he was actively advertising his photography through a series of articles in British publications. The RCS collection includes at least five of Bourne's commercial albums, alongside countless other prints in compilation albums and collections. Some of these were presented to the society by its members, while others were purchased. Bourne's work is among the best example of the process of collodion wet plate photography. So not only are the images of very high technical quality, but they also reflect his ambitious commercial nous. Bourne returned to England in 1870 to pursue new interests, and the firm continued under different management. His work remained on sale until the collection was destroyed by fire in 1991. And today Bourne's work is found in the collections of many major museums and galleries. John Thompson was a Scottish-born photographer operating around the same time as Samuel Bourne in India. He joined his elder brother, who was a watchmaker and a photographer, in Singapore in 1862. Again, like Bourne, Thompson then spent most of the next decade travelling extensively around Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Thailand and China. The RCS holds a copy of his illustrated work on China, significant in that Thompson was one of the first Western photographers to be active in that part of the world. The China volume hasn't yet been digitized, so what you see here on screen is an image from his publication through Cyprus with a camera in the autumn of 1878, and it depicts a group of women at a well. The Cyprus volume was part of the private library of Claude Cobham, a commissioner in the district of Larnaca following the British occupation of Cyprus in 1876. Cobham gave his collection to the society in 1913. This photograph is typical of the Woodbury type process favoured by Thompson. As with Samuel Bourne, Thompson returned to a settled life in England in the 1870s and never travelled extensively again. However, the Royal Geographic Society did appoint him to be a photographic tutor to instruct explorers in the use of photography to document their travels. And Thompson was also an elected member of what was then the Photographic Society. Another major commercial success was the Dunedin-based firm of Burton Brothers, founded by Walter John Burton and Alfred Henry Burton, who had emigrated to New Zealand in the 1860s. The photograph on screen is from an album containing views of New Zealand, Samoa and Fiji. And as with the work of Samuel Bourne and John Thompson, is largely the product of a photographic expedition undertaken by Alfred Burton to the Pacific Islands in 1884 and to newly opened up King Country in New Zealand in 1885. The view on this slide shows a group of Maori peoples in Western dress, posing by the side of Lake Tarawera near Rotorua in North Island. 
The firm offered the portraiture service for settlers in New Zealand, as well as landscape and ethnographic photography, such as this album, for a commercial audience. It's not a especially evident from this album, but the Burton brothers were also known for pioneering the technique of a traveling darkroom. Another pioneering firm to mention was that of the Lisk Carew brothers based in Freetown, Sierra Leone. The firm was founded by Alfonso Lisk Carew with his brother Arthur probably serving as an assistant. The Lisk Carews were born in Freetown they were part of what was known as the Creole community in Sierra Leone, being the descendants of enslaved African-American or African people who settled in West Africa after liberation in the 19th century. The firm advertised itself as a photography studio and an importer of photographic materials, stationary toys and fancy goods. The reputation of the firm was established in 1910 when Alfonso was appointed official photographer for the visit of the Duke and Duchess of Connaught. The image on screen was probably taken in 1912 or 1913, and it's from a series of prints depicting what was then Bathurst, now Banjul in the Gambia. This is a fish stand at the Albert Market, a famous 19th century street market in Banjul, named after Prince Albert. Most examples of the, Lisk, of the work of the Lisk Carew brothers in the RCS collection are to be found in a series of early postcards of Sierra Leone. I haven't mentioned the postcards yet, but it's worth pointing out that the RCS has some 10 boxes um, forming quite a significant postcard collection. Um, moving away from examples of commercial photography, the work of Alfred Fisher, a substantial named collection shows the use of photography as an educational tool. In this instance, in the service of the Colonial Office Visual Instruction Committee, or COVIC. COVIC was an ambitious initiative to gather lecture material about the empire for use in British schools, specifically to produce textbooks with accompanying sets of slides. Fisher who was an artist by training, was appointed following a recruitment process in 1907. The aim was for a three-year project to capture as many as 1,800 slides documenting Fisher's journeys throughout the empire. So Canada, India, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, the Caribbean, East and West Africa, the Mediterranean, and routes in between. Fisher was specifically briefed to try to capture the ordinary lives of the people he encountered, as well as to showcase positive aspects of British rule. This is a typical page from one of the 29 albums which he assembled. The images here are from the first segment of his journey to Ceylon, India and Burma in December 1907. You can see here that Fisher visited one of the princely rulers in Burma. The albums are extensively captioned with Fisher's impressions on his journey and some comment on his photographic practice. And there's also a rather eccentric system of numbering. Um, in this example, which is taken from a later album, um, there's a group of fishermen cutting up shark meat in the neighborhood of Wei Hai Wei in November, 1908. This is from Fisher's second tour which encompassed Canada, Hong Kong, Singapore, and North Borneo, which is now Sabah in Malaysia. British Way Highway was the least territory of the United Kingdom between 1898 and 1930. It's a strategically important port on the northeastern coast of China. The whole COVID scheme was plagued by a shortage of funds and generally slow progress. A few of the envisaged textbooks were produced, notably the India volume in 1910, and a volume in 1912 called The Sea Road to the East, which featured Wei Highway. On average, 350 lantern slides accompanied each lecture or textbook. It was envisaged that the lantern technology would support projection of images in a classroom setting. 
However, the textbooks and the slides proved very expensive and they don't seem to have been widely purchased. In fact, we have very few of the slides in the RCS collection. So as it turned out, Fisher wasn't able to visit any part of Africa or the Caribbean within the three years of the initiative. So the COVID committee separately acquired photographs from these regions. In contrast to Fisher's own work, many of the photographs of the outstanding regions were acquired from established photographers. This photograph, for example, showing George Wilson, the deputy commissioner of the Uganda Protectorate between 1902 and 1909, was taken by Alfred Lobo, a commercial ph photographer based in Kampala. Other examples include views of Zanzibar, taken by A.C. Gomez and Sons, photographs of Dominica, taken by George Pinard, photographs of St. Kitts by Jose Anjo, and so on. So whatever the merits of the COVID scheme, the value of the Fisher photograph collection is obvious. And we're fortunate that the collection was extensively worked on by Dr. Sabrina Menegini in the last five years for her PhD. Sabrina's embedded research culminated in an exhibition which was entitled Classroom Photographic Journeys. And this brought together Fisher's photographs and artworks in one place for the first time. Well, I seem to have taken you on something of a tour of the world, or at least a tour of those parts of the world, which for an interlude were under British control. And although it's been something of a whirlwind tour, I hope it's given a good general introduction to the RCS Photograph Collection, for those of you unfamiliar with its scope and content. For such a sweeping introduction, it seemed easier to focus on the geographical extent of the collection and some of the notable sub-collections. So the image currently on screen is of King Street, Sydney in 1908, and it features a quite a prominent advertisement for the removal of superfluous hair. The true value of the collection to researchers, though, increasingly lies in the fact that the subject material is so very wide ranging that it allows comparative study of trade, industry, agriculture, mission work, modes of transportation, exploration, healthcare, the growth of cities, education, and much more. The diversity and variety of the content in the collection, reflecting the fact that there was never a very tightly defined collecting policy for photographs, is now very much a strength of the collection. So just a couple more thoughts before I conclude. As a largely colonial era collection, issues of terminology, tone and description should not be overlooked. Not only have place names and spellings changed with time, but many of the original captions and descriptions are outdated, inaccurate, and in some cases pejorative or offensive. The fact remains that the collection is largely set apart from the communities it documents. It represents the perspective of the colonizer and the settler, what some people have called the colonial gaze. In managing the RCS photograph collection, my efforts and those of my predecessors have been to digitize as much as possible, to make as much visible as possible within the constraints of funding and projects and copyright, but really to present the photographs as they appear and to augment this with surrounding contextual information. This is ongoing and slow work, but it's only through making visible what's in the collection that we can really understand and where necessarily improve the description of material. So um, as promised, here are the links to the relevant RCS resources, which I mentioned during the course of the talk and also my contact details. Um, I'll leave you with this final image, which is again taken from the Fisher Collection. It's one of a series of four images titled Shipping Camels for Somaliland and was taken in 1908 in Aden. So thank you once again for the invitation to speak and thank you all for listening. 
Great. Thank you so much, Sally. That was that was really interesting. And it's not a collection I'd previously known very much about. So it's been a real insight into the content. Um, we've got some questions from our audience. So if anyone else has any, please drop them here. And I just wondered if I could start by just asking a couple of questions. Um, firstly, do you have any sense of how many um, female photographers are represented in the collection? Um, very few. I, I did want to do a segment on um, female photographers and I really struggled to find some. So we mostly have, um, say, albums which are donated by members where the photographer was probably a female, but we don't have very good examples of prominent female photographers whose names would be sort of well known and recognised. Thank you. Um, and then Callie asked whether you have any autochromes represented in the collection. Uh, probably, I don't know. Um, so the, the TypeScript catalogue, which I showed you right at the beginning, which was the old fashioned catalogue before we electronically catalogued, um, was compiled through the 1970s and 1980s by um, people who knew a lot more about photography as a process. So when I catalogue things now, I just describe something as a photograph, unless it's really obvious what it is. <laughs> um, so there would be a way to go back and to find out how many of those types of things are in the collection, or you could even search the catalogue um, because all that information has been transcribed. But I personally know very little, <laughs> um, so I wouldn't be able to say or to give a number. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'm just going to add to that and ask whether you know if there are any stereo photographs within the collection. Yes, I think we've got a few examples. Um, I think they relate to, off the top of my head, to Hong Kong, I think. Okay. Um, and then at, uh, I think towards the start of your presentation, you said that you're um, still adding to the collection. And I just wondered how you go about deciding what has value to add to the collection and what's really beyond your, or what essentially what's your current collecting policy for the RCS collection? Yeah, it's, it's quite tricky because the, the nature of the society has changed. You know, it doesn't operate in the same way that it used to. So um, when we're offered collections, we try to see if there is an obvious link to the RCS. So if it's a family collection, was a member of a family, previously a member of the society, is there some kind of link like that? Um, the other thing which we would look at is if it complements something which is already in the collection, so a lot of the names of photographers and things recur. So that would be a strong um, uh, criteria for taking something in. There's also some parts, although I took you all around the world, there are some parts of the Commonwealth which aren't well represented. Um, so if we were offered collections there, and even if there wasn't an obvious connection to the RCS, um, we would accept the collection. Um, so it's really on a case-by-case -case basis, if it can complement something which we already have in the collection, or if there's an obvious um, connection to the society. And then um, we've got a collection, of, uh, sorry, question rather, about whether the collection is being used to support um, archives in some of those former British um Com well, in, in, to, in, in some of those for, former British territories and current Commonwealth countries to, to actually return some of the those visual that visual imagery back to, to the countries and what sort of programmes might be around that? Yeah, we, we've, we've started to do a little bit of work around that. So the very first image which I showed you, um, which was of a scene in South Africa, um, we ran a project over the last two years, which was to digitize part of the Southern African, um, part of the material relating to Southern Africa. And some of that was driven by the sharing of digital resources. Um, so those images were shared with an institution in South Africa. Um, so they exist on our digital platform, but also on their digital platform. So there's work of that nature, which we do. Um, we've also recently worked with the museum in Uganda again around sharing of images. Um, so it's possible to do where um, it's funded under a project. Unfortunately, we often are approached by people on others, you know, in other parts of the world 
We would really like to help and to share the resources. We still need the digitization to be paid for. It is very expensive. So at the moment, it is a bit project driven, but that's certainly the direction that we would like to to move in because it just makes sense to share what we have, um, particularly with communities, you know, who know a lot more about that about the content of the photographs and can help us with the description and the identification of places and people and that kind of thing. Um, and we have another another question from Callie actually asking whether you have any film or moving image material. Yes, we have um, a small number of films. Um, I, I didn't cover them in this talk um, and they have been digitized and they are available um, via a streaming media service. Um, I think there's probably less than 20 in total. And are they amateur or were they made by the COI or any of the other sort of government um, bodies? They're mostly amateur. So one of them relates to um, a chap called Tims, who was um, a, um, an aviation officer in India and Pakistan. Um, and those are those are definitely amateur. So we don't, we don't have any of the kind of official films. Okay, and uh, uh, there's a comment from uh, Dr. Jama Musay saying thank you for uh, concluding with the photograph from Somaliland. Uh, you, Doctor. Yes, I, I think the photograph is in Aden, but the, the camels were on their way to Somaliland. <laughs> right. There's, there's nod noddings from, from Dr. Jama. Um, yeah. So I think that may bring us to the end of uh, our talk this evening uh, we don't have any more questions from our audience so uh, I think it just leaves me to say firstly thank you to Gilly for arranging this evening and thank you Sally so much for for sharing your knowledge and um, sharing some of those pictures